thank you very much indeed for coming. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the first in our uh, OU <coughs> History Lecture Series. And this is a new initiative by the History Department at the OU to give uh, a kind of insight into some of the cutting edge research that our historians working here are doing. But also we've chosen the topics to have some resonance with contemporary events. And I think you'll probably agree that we've really hit the nail on the head this time. I had a word with the cabinet office in December and uh, they pulled the vote for us, which was very accommodating, rescheduled it just when we wanted, very kind of them. So um, I'll introduce Luke in just a moment, but just to say that uh, this is also being streamed out live uh, on the interweb. So there'll be questions afterwards. The procedure, if you're watching live and you'd like to send a question in, is to send it to the email address, which is um, next to the to the kind of the video window. But I'll give it to you again, just in case. It's fas fas sorry f a double -S, s dash history dash lectures at open dot a dot uh, ac dot uk. So please feel free to send your questions in if you're watching online. If you're in the room, the procedure is to put your hand up. I hope that's uh, not too technical for everybody. Um, so with no more ado, it's my very great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Luc André Brunet, who is a history a lecturer in the history of 20th century Europe. And Luc is going to be talking to us today uh, with Europe, but not of it, why Britain joined the European community. Over to you, Luc. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Richard, for the introduction. Uh, and hello, and, and uh, thank you to all of you who, uh, who are joining us today in Milton Keynes and to those of you who are joining us online. Uh, so I'm delighted to be giving the first uh, lecture in this uh, series, which is organized by uh, Richard, uh, and part of the events to mark the 50th anniversary of the Open University. And as Richard mentioned, I think the subject of tonight's lecture could hardly be more topical. As you know, this evening, um, just after this lecture, I think, uh, the House of Commons, uh, the MPs, will be uh, voting on the proposed deal of Theresa May uh, on the terms of Brexit. Now, given that the future relationship of Britain uh, with Europe could well change quite significantly by the end of the evening, I think I'll refrain from commenting too specifically on uh, the Brexit deal currently being debated um, in Westminster, um, and any musings on the imminent future of Britain's relations with the European Union. So instead, this evening, I'd like to focus on um, Britain's initial relationship with the forerunner to the European Union, namely the European Community, and before that, the European <coughs> Coal and Steel Community. And I'm interested especially in exploring a specific puzzle around Britain and Europe. So when the European Community was first set up, uh, in the 1950s. Britain was invited to join uh, as a founding member, but the British gov government decided against it. So the European community was set up in 1958, but within barely three years, by 1961, the British government had come to the opposite conclusion, that it should belatedly seek membership in the European community. Now, this was a dramatic U-turn in British policy, and one uh, whose consequences we're still grappling with today. So in today's lecture, I'd like to delve into this, and I'd like to look at two related questions in particular. So first, why did Britain decide to not join the European community in the 1950s? And then second, why did the British government reverse this decision by 1961 and apply to join so, so soon after the community was set up? Now, before we dig into these two questions, I think it would be useful to contextualize uh, this discussion uh, just with a very quick overview of the history of European integration since the end of the Second World War. So for that, we go back to May 1950, when the French government proposed uh, the so-called Schumann Plan. As this was written by Jean Monnet, uh, who we see in the photograph, who was the head of French economic planning at the time, and it was put forward by the French foreign minister, Robert Schumann. And the idea, effectively, was to pool uh, the coal and steel industries of several countries of Western Europe, really whoever was willing to, to sign up, and that these industries would be placed under the authority um, of a supranational body known as the high authority uh, of the coal and steel community. And by supranational, I mean that um, specific agreed upon powers would be delegated by national governments to this European high authority whose decisions in these areas would be binding. 
And this led in 1952 to the creation of the European coal and steel community. Later on in the 50s, this was expanded to other areas of the economy. And in 1958, we saw the creation of the European community uh, or the European economic community, is the full name. Now, in both cases, six countries agree to participate. France, West Germany, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, uh, who are collectively uh, usually referred to as the six, for obvious reasons. Um, though in Britain, uh, the favored term tended to be the somewhat derogatory Little Europe to refer to this, uh, this grouping of six countries. Now, in 1961, the British government, led by Macmillan, belatedly applied to join the community. Now, unfortunately for Britain, the road to membership was a bumpy one, as we can see from this uh, German cartoon from the period. Now, in 1963, the French President uh, Charles de Gaulle, pictured here with Macmillan, um, vetoed the first British application uh, to join. Four years later, Harold Wilson and his Labour government applied to join yet again, and once more, the French stalled that application. In 1970, the Conservative government, uh, led by Heath, applied yet again, or reactivated that uh, 67 application, uh, which finally was successful, uh, and Britain joined uh, the European community in January 1973, along with the Republic of Ireland and Denmark. Finally, 20 years after this, uh, in 1993, the European community became the European Union, of which Britain is, for the moment, still a member. So this gives us a potted history of the process of uh, European integration uh, over the past few decades, and this is hopefully should serve to contextualize our discussion. Uh, and specifically, it allows us to tackle the question, so why did the British government uh, choose to not participate in the coal and steel community and then the European community? Well, the traditional explanation uh, in much of the historiography is that this was a catastrophic choice by the government led by Clement Attlee. So it's argued that Britain overestimated its strength following its victory in the Second World War and believed that Britain remained one of the big three alongside the United States and the Soviet Union. The British government's also criticized for um, effectively favoring its empire, even as it crumbled around them in the years after the Second World War, over cooperation with their closest uh, European <coughs> neighbors uh, who were in the midst of an economic boom at the time. So to use a phrase coined by the conservative uh, politician, Anthony Nutting, Britain missed the bus by not joining in the 1950s. Now, there's certainly some merit to this explanation. And in hindsight, the British decision not to join the European community at its creation meant that Britain missed the opportunity to decisively shape Europe's first institutions during this time. And the UK, had it joined in the 1950s, might well have emerged as the leader of this bloc of six or seven or potentially even more uh, European powers, which Britain might have been able to use to further bolster its position as a great power on the world stage. But rather than retrospectively dismiss uh, this decision as a missed opportunity, I think it's more interesting to go back and try and understand why the British government at this uh, time made this decision based on the information available to it at the time. I think we can focus on three main factors to understand that decision. So one factor, of course, was the importance of the Commonwealth. Now, in hindsight, it's clear that Britain backed the wrong horse in favoring trade with the Commonwealth over trade with the European community. But in the early 1950s, this was by no means clear. First of all, the economies of the other European powers were not particularly impressive in the early 1950s. They were still recovering from the Second World War, where, unlike Britain, uh, the six had all experienced uh, the ravages of military defeat and occupation, um, and far more of their infrastructure and their industrial base had to be rebuilt uh, than was the case uh, in Britain, even with the, the damage sustained um, uh, from the Luftwaffe over the Second World War in Britain. Now, it's also important to remember that the economic boom in Western Europe associated with this period came later on in the 1950s, uh, indeed, partially as a consequence of the process of European integration. So in 1950, when Britain received the invitation to take part in the Schuman Plan, Britain's industrial output was roughly equivalent to that of France and West Germany combined. In terms of trade, meanwhile, the importance of the Commonwealth still significantly outweighed Britain's trade with its continental partners. So in the early 1950s, the Commonwealth uh, accounted for just under half of both Britain's exports and imports. The corresponding figure for the six during this period is about 12 and 19%. So significant figures, but markedly less important than trade with the Commonwealth. 
So based on the existing economic situation in the 1950s, it made more sense to the British government to, um, to maintain and protect ex its existing uh, trade with the Commonwealth than sacrifice this um, in favor of the highly uncertain gains that joining the community might bring. Now the second consideration had to do with the supranational architecture of the community and the pooling of sovereignty, which was made a precondition of joining uh, the community. Now in the Brexit referendum campaign of 2016, of course, this pooling of sovereignty came under attack as the Leave side called on the British electorate to take back control. Now these days we typically think of this argument as one uh, on the political right, maybe associated with figures from Nigel Farage um, to Boris Johnson to Michael Gove and so on. But in the early 1950s, it was a decidedly left-wing argument uh, that focused on uh, opposition to sharing control of British industry. So at the head of Labour's first majority governments, um, elected in 1945 and then again in uh, February 1950, um, Clement Attlee had succeeded in the long-held Labour objective of nationalising key industries. In 1946, we see the nationalisation of coal mining, followed in 1949 by the Iron and Steel Act. From the perspective of the Labour government, the invitation in 1950 to share control over these industries, which had only just come into public hands in Britain, led to concerns that membership of the community would compromise Labour's economic priorities. And indeed, this left-wing argument that the European community and later on the European Union is effectively a capitalist club that would thwart democratic socialism at the national level is a concern that we see raised intermittently uh, from the left ever since. Now, the third factor informing the British government's decision to not join had to do with Britain's role as a world power. So unlike the Six, uh, of course, Britain had not suffered military defeat and occupation and regime change during the Second World War. It had been one of the victorious powers, and it had influenced the shape of the post-war international order. By the early 1950s, of course, it was clear to the British government that they were not a superpower in the same category as the United States and the Soviet Union, but it nevertheless remained an important international power. It was an ally of the United States, uh, through its empire, it had an important string of strategic naval bases throughout the world. And from 1952 onwards, Britain became the third nuclear weapon state, joining the two superpowers. And following the London Conference, the Commonwealth Conference uh, of 1949, it seemed that the Commonwealth, now including the Republic of India, had a bright future ahead of it. So all of this dissuaded the British government from pooling its sovereignty and its industry with its Western European neighbors. And it's also important to remember that this idea of Britain with its Commonwealth and Empire as being separate from the rest of Europe was certainly not a uniquely British view. Uh, Jean Monnet, for example, the brains behind the European Coal and Steel Community and the Schuman Plan, had suggested in the 1940s that alongside the United States and the Soviet Union, that a united Europe could stand as an important uh, international player on the world scene. But alongside these three, he identified a fourth player, namely Britain with its Commonwealth and Empire, which Monet acknowledged was distinct from a, a united Europe founded mainly on a Franco-German axis. De Gaulle's veto of Britain's application in 1963 was also justified, at least partially, on the grounds that, in his view, Britain was not fully European. So to sum up, while the British decision to not join the European community meant that the UK missed its chance to shape the first European institutions, in a way that may have been more to Britain's liking. This decision was not simply the result of delusions of grandeur in the aftermath of the Second World War. Rather, based on the situation as it appeared to decision makers in Britain in the early 1950s, it was a perfectly rational policy on its own terms. And the government concluded that the national interest would be best served by not joining the community. The problem, however, is that the conditions that informed this decision deteriorated rapidly in the years following. Um, so while Commonwealth trade had been far more important for the British economy uh, than trade with the rest of the Europe in the early 1950s, this was no longer the case by the early 1960s. So in 1950, for example, um, the year of the, the Schuman Declaration, uh, the Commonwealth took roughly half of Britain's exports. By 1960, just 10 years later, this figure had fallen to 30%. Moreover, the members of the European, uh, the European community were enjoying a sustained economic boom, outpacing Britain in economic growth year after year. And as a result, by the early 1960s, Britain was now doing more trade 
with uh, the six members of the European Community than it was with its Commonwealth. So if rational policy making dictated that Britain should ensure the greatest possible access to its main markets, then this meant saying no to Europe in the 1950s, but from the 1960s onwards, yes to Europe. Now even more important than these changing economic realities, I would argue, is Britain's rapidly diminishing presence on the world stage. In 1956, of course, we have the Suez Crisis, in which Britain was forced into a humiliating reversal of policy as a result of the threat of US economic pressure, leading to the resignation of the Prime Minister, Anthony Eden. The late 1950s also saw the acceleration of decolonization in Africa. And this, along with the, uh, the exit of South Africa uh, from the Commonwealth in 1961 under its apartheid regime, highlighted the fact that the Commonwealth had become a much more diverse organization than it had been and one much less susceptible to bending to Britain's will than had been the case earlier when it was a, a small group um, of the so-called uh, old dominions or white dominions. And furthermore, the influence of the US on Britain's decision was crucial. So successive American administrations uh, had supported and encouraged uh, the European integration process led by France from the early 1950s onwards and were consistently supportive of Britain applying to join the European community. It was also feared that with Britain's uh, relative uh, political or strategic decline during this period, and with Britain being outpaced economically by the members of the European community, that the United States might come to favor another European power, specifically West Germany, as its preferred European partner rather than Britain. So in this sense, joining the community, far from being at the expense of Britain's so-called special relationship with the United States, would actually be a means of strengthening it and making Britain an even more valuable partner to the United States. So in short, against the realities of Britain's economic weaknesses and ongoing decline as a great power, the European community was seen as a means for Britain to bolster its power internationally. Curiously, despite Britain's weakening position, the Macmillan government never really doubted that Britain would be able to set the terms on which it would join the European community. So as a result, the UK's first application to join in 1961 came with a long list of special arrangements and exemptions, uh, ranging from uh, protection of British farmers uh, to Commonwealth links uh, to relations with other uh, trading partners and so on, what we might describe today as wanting to have one's cake and eat it. The rejection of this application in 1963 was perhaps predictable, and only when Britain reapplied, largely on the community's terms rather than trying to set the terms itself, was Britain ultimately successful. Now this discussion of Britain's reasons for applying to join, I think, brings out two key insights. So first, Britain's motivations were largely defensive. The government wanted to curb Britain's economic and political or strategic decline, and saw membership in the, in the European community as a means of doing this. So there was very little enthusiasm within the government for the European project as such. Rather, it was simply seen as less bad than the alternative of being shut out uh, of the community altogether. We can see this uh, in the political cartoon published in August 1961, just after Macmillan, uh, the Macmillan government applies. We see uh, Macmillan very hesitantly dipping his toe in the water without much enthusiasm. Second, there never seemed to be any doubt in the minds of the members of the British government that once Britain was part of the community, that it would emerge naturally as the bloc's leader. Indeed, the political argument behind Britain joining was largely that the community could take the place of the Commonwealth. And so Britain's role, rather than being uh, at head of the Commonwealth, would be the leader of this Western European bloc. It was never seriously entertained that this might not happen. For example, that the French or German governments may not be so eager to be placed under British tutelage. So by means of a conclusion then, I'd like to return to the puzzle that I set out at the beginning of this evening's lecture. Why did Britain not join in the 1950s and then jo apply to join in the early 1960s? Well, despite the apparent inconsistency in British policy, I would argue that there was in fact an underlying consistency in the British government's pursuit of what it thought would be best for Britain. Specifically, throughout this period, the government followed the policy of maintaining or securing the greatest possible access to Britain's main trading partners. 
So although in hindsight it's clear that Britain backed the wrong horse in opting for the Commonwealth over the community in the 1950s, it was nonetheless a rational policy in the pursuit of the national interest. So too was the decision to apply to join in 1961, even if that application was handled rather poorly. So I think this marks an important contrast with today, where Brexit effectively means adding barriers to trade with Britain's most important trading partners. Similarly, the decision to join was informed by Britain's declining international position and the diminishing role of the Commonwealth in the hopes that the booming European community could be the means of shoring up Britain's standing in the world. We can see this uh, depicted in yet another cartoon uh, where the Commonwealth is presented as a sinking ship, um, but Europe as a rather promising alternative. But today, however, it's not at all clear what could possibly take the EU's place. And I think the most likely result is a decline in Britain's international position and influence in the world. But this is in part explained by a crucial difference between the decision to join and the decision to leave. Now, the decisions regarding British membership in the community that we've been discussing this evening, in the 1950s and the 1960s, tended to be taken by a small group of ministers and policymakers, unlike the choice to leave in 2016, which of course was decided by a national referendum. So the outcome of the referendum suggests in part that voters are more concerned with questions of immigration, or such as the funding of the NHS, rather than the rather more obscure questions of trade flows and Britain's international prestige. In other words, arriving at a cabinet decision and winning a national referendum require two decidedly different strategies. Throughout the 1960s, and in many ways ever since, British governments concluded, often reluctantly and half-heartedly, that it would be less bad for Britain to be a member of the European community, or later the European Union, than to be outside. And we can see this attitude reflected in a slogan from the Remain side in the 2016 referendum, better off in. This reflected the sober but somewhat unenthusiastic assessment that things would be worse for Britain if it were to leave. And this ultimately proved to be less appealing than the optimism reflected in the message of take back control. Now at this very moment in the House of Commons, of course, MPs are struggling to define precisely what taking back control actually means. Whatever the outcome, it's clear that the consequences of Britain's decision to apply to join uh, the European community back in 1961 continue to shape British politics today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Luke, for a fascinating talk, which provides some really useful historical context, I think, ahead of tonight's vote in Parliament. So. It's just a reminder to people at home, if you have any questions, you can email them. Richard will be manning the email and looking out for questions from people at home. Uh, in the meantime, though, I'll be taking some questions from people in the room. So do we have any questions to kick things off? Yes. Uh, a couple of points. Oh, sorry. Well. <laughs> <laughs> OK, a couple of points. When the ECSC was set up, the whole idea of that was to combine the, the steel industries of France and Germany because it's very difficult to go to war if you didn't control your own steel industry. But obviously Britain must have, must have rejected that idea for whatever reason. Um, the second point, I can't think, can you answer that bit for, as, the, as the first point? Sure, shall, shall I take, <coughs> shall I do that? Right, so, um, right, you're absolutely right. And, and so in the, um, uh, the Schumann Declaration, Robert Schumann um, uh, highlighted the, uh, the symbolic nature of, of coal and steel, saying that these were uh, the necessary industries to wage war, and that by pooling them, it would make war uh, not only unthinkable, but materially impossible. Um, so I, I think at, at the heart of it, the, uh, the Schumann plan was uh, effectively a French proposal focused squarely on, on Western Germany. And there were all sorts of other reasons behind France's strategy for dealing with Germany at the, uh, that time uh, to explain why that was the case. But it was also open to all countries in, in Western Europe. Um, Italy um, joined largely for other reasons, so uh, for both West Germany and Italy. Part of the appeal was that, um, of course, they had been the Axis powers in uh, the Second World War. They remained to differing degrees of international pariahs on the world stage. Uh, whereas by joining, uh, it was uh, that they were able to, to be rehabilitated 
uh, effectively and stand as equals uh, to France. Um, for a country like the Netherlands, for example, um, they didn't really have much of either a steel or a coal uh, industry, uh, but they, they found that it would be politically advantageous to join. So it, I, I think you're right that it, it was founded primarily on this question of ensuring Franco-German peace in the post-war era, um, but it was certainly open, uh, open to Britain, and it might well have joined as, as the other four countries chose to. And the second point, if you don't mind, um, as a young teenager, uh, I can remember going round the streets with posters of Edward Heath, etc., uh, extolling the virtues of the EUC as it was then. And if you looked into it, you knew that the whole point of the EUC was, in the end, a United States of Europe, which I thoroughly agree with. Um, you never, you never heard this extolled during the, the the debates, and you certainly hear very little about that now, because I personally I don't think the British people have ever been truly European. Um, right. So I, I think that you've touched on a really important debate, uh, not only within Britain, but I think across every member state of, uh, of the European Union uh, today, which is how, just how federalist uh, should the European project be? Is the ultimate aim to create more or less a single political entity, uh, as the, the United States of Europe, um, or is it rather uh, much more effective cooperation, economic efficiency, and so on? Um, and I think even I mean, the, amongst historians there's an important debate of, well, was the European coal and steel community really uh, primarily motivated by this idea of the first, kind of the founding step of what would ultimately become the United States of Europe, um, or was it purely about national self-interest uh, of, of the countries that joined? Um, but I, I think you're right that in Britain that, um, I think the, the, say the federalist voice is, is much quieter uh, or, or finds much less resonance uh, than in, uh, certainly in, in France or Germany, although even uh, today that's, uh, that's problematic in, in, those, uh, in those political environments as well. Okay, I think we have a question uh, from someone at home watching online. Okay, Stuart is asking whether Luke would like to say anything about the impact of EFTA on the 1961 decision to apply for membership. Would you like to say something about that, Luke? I would. Thank you, uh, Stuart and Richard, for uh, that question. Um, yeah, so one thing um, I, I should say it was in a draft version of this talk, which ended up being an hour long. So uh, in a, a, the 20-minute the version, EFTA got cut out, unfortunately. Um, but yes, yeah, so in the mid-1950s, uh, after the European community was set up, Britain tried to create its own free trade bloc, uh, the European Free Trade Area, or EFTA, um, with the members of uh, Scandinavia, Switzerland, um, and uh, slightly controversially, um, the pseudo-fascist regime in Portugal. Um, and this was meant really as, as an alternative to, uh, to the European community. Um, but in the end, it didn't really succeed um, for a, a number of reasons. Um, but it, it, it was never envisioned as anything more than simply a free trade area, unlike the European community, which had this uh, supranational element, which, which set it apart. Um, and so uh, I'd mentioned that the UK had wanted a, a number of exemptions when it applied to join the European community in 1961. Among these was that it wanted to keep all of its uh, privileged um, economic relations with its partners uh, in EFTA, uh, and the European community uh, effectively said no. Um, and, uh, but by the, the early 1960s, even Britain had, uh, had abandoned hopes that, that EFTA would, uh, would amount to, uh, to a real alternative to the European community. Um, so I think it shows that Britain was was engaged with its European um, neighbours, if not necessarily with the six, with uh, the seven, as, as the EFTA was known, um, but, uh, but ultimately that, uh, that Britain uh, was unsuccessful in, in mounting a, a challenge to the European community. Do we have any more questions in the audience? Yeah, Annika. Can I first of all thank you very much for a really interesting talk. I certainly would have been happy to listen to the hour-long version. I think you did really well to condense that into 20 really interesting 
minutes, and I just wish that um, both the people at Westminster and indeed everybody who turned out for the referendum knew a little bit about this background, because it seems so um, striking, particularly a lot of the parallels. You talked about having your cake and eating it, and the idea that the Macmillan government went into these negotiations thinking, we can really make demands, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're so impressive, and clearly the same thing's happening now, and it's, it's, not, really, it's not really necessarily the case. So I think it's, it's really food for thought. But I wondered whether, at the time that these negotiations, or these, these decisions were made, rather than the negotiations, which follow the decision that's being made, yes, we will go in, um, whether anyone gave any thought to how one would possibly in future get out. This is clearly where we are now. I just, you know, did anyone think ahead? What if it doesn't work out? What if um, actually eventually, you know, there will be other trading partners even more promising, is, which is of course one of the arguments we're, we're hearing. Did anyone think ahead? It's a very good question. I, I, I'm inclined to say n that it wasn't really top of mind. I think the, the idea was, uh, well, how do we protect as much as uh, of, of what we already have in terms of links with the Commonwealth and so on, and <coughs> sort of have all of those advantages and the advantages of community membership? Um, and then I think the idea was that if, they, if Britain couldn't get a good enough deal that it could simply walk away and, and uh, rely on, on the Commonwealth, um, I don't, to my knowledge, there wasn't any sort of escape hatch built in uh, to that strategy. Um, but when Britain finally does join, of course, in 1973, um, the first thing that they do, rather than try to emerge as the leader of the bloc or, or fit in as good Europeans, is that they immediately try to renegotiate all the things that they had just agreed to to get in. Uh, they try and reopen them from the inside. Um, and so this is the, the renegotiated package, which is then uh, put to the British people in the 1975 referendum asking them, to, do you want to remain part of the European community or not? Uh, which, of course, had a very different outcome from the uh, 2016 referendum. Thanks. And one more question over here. I was just curious um, to know, in terms of what people expected at the time we joined, um, how far did they expect the European um, community to have control over not just our trade, but other aspects of life, our legislation and immigration and how, how what was the expectation in terms of how far we would give up control to Europe so that's a good question I think um, so initially I think there weren't much th th there wasn't much by uh, in the way of, of fears of, uh, of this spilling over into into other areas because it was a gradual process and I think the idea was that Britain as a member would be able to put a break on certain sort of the, the more federalist tendencies with which the British government might be less comfortable. And we see this particularly, say, during the Thatcher period and the negotiation of the, the single market and so on. Um, and actually, as uh, touching on migration, initially the, the British fears were that with uh, the greater uh, freedom uh, of movement of people, um, that it, the issue wouldn't be migration into the UK, it would actually be migration out uh, as uh, all these Britons uh, fled uh, Britain with its economic problems and instead uh, stampeded to the, the dynamic economies of France and Germany and, and so on. Um, so it, uh, and certainly in, in the 1975 referendum, for example, migration didn't, didn't feature at all. Uh, food prices did, um, but migration was, was virtually absent. Happy, what, one more question from someone at home, do you, Richard? Thanks, Neil. Okay, so uh, Malcolm is asking, uh, and this, this is a tough one for you, Luke, so gird your loins. Are there statistics regarding the demographics, demographic comparison between the 1975 referendum to join and the 2016 referendum to leave? No pressure. Um, by demographic, I mean, almost certainly somebody has crunched these numbers, but um, it just, I'm... I don't know if I can ask a follow-up question to clarify, but um, by means of who backed sort of remain and leave in, in the or the, the pro-Europe uh, and anti-Europe. Um, I'm not entirely sure about the, the demographics uh, of the sort of age groups uh, and so on, but certainly the, the support for Europe was much broader in, in 1975, uh, and even amongst the political classes, um, 
I mean, we have a figure like uh, Harold Wilson, who of course was prime minister in, in 75. Um, in the early 1960s, he was opposed to community membership. Uh, by the mid-1960s, he'd come around to the idea that, yes, Britain is, is better off in than out, uh, and of course applied in, in 1967 uh, with the second application to join. Uh, and in the 1975 referendum, he was able to remain somewhat neutral. Uh, I mean, he, he tended to uh, prefer, uh, or he, he believed that Britain would be better off uh, in Europe uh, than out of Europe, but he didn't take on a, a lead role in, in the campaign that was left to, to other cabinet colleagues, notably Roy Jenkins. Um, but really, on among the, the leading political figures who actually campaigned against British membership in uh, the 1975 referendum, they tended to be uh, not fringe politicians, but I mean the people on the extreme uh, right or left tended to be the most prominent uh, supporters. So people like Enoch Powell um, on the right, uh, someone like Tony Benn on the left, uh, who were I mean, on the, the right and left wings of their respective party, Powell, of course, by this time had, had been ejected from, uh, from the Conservative Party. Um, I think the only newspaper backing um, the anti-European side in the 1975 uh, campaign uh, was the Morning Star, um, on the grounds that uh, it, it didn't really suit the communist agenda uh, to have a strong European community. Um, whereas the Daily Mail, the Telegraph, and so on, were all fully in favor of, of Europe. Uh, and obviously things changed a bit since then. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure, Malcolm, if that answers your, your question, but hopefully it, uh, it contributes. Okay, time for another question from the audience. Ian's got one here. Yeah, I was intrigued by um, the fact that when you were discussing economic matters, the trade changes and so on, your juxtaposition was always between the European community and the Commonwealth. But of course, there's another player, which is the United States, which isn't just, you know, a strategic military whatever connection for Britain. It's also been a very important trading partner. And I think I'm right in saying off the top of my head that even now remains the largest, in, by individual country, remains the largest single uh, trading relationship with Britain. And certainly in terms of investment relationships, I think is significantly the largest. So I wonder if it, it's, it's quite as clear cut as you were sort of making out that, you know, in the 1950s it was self-evidently the national interest that the Commonwealth was the way to go and by the 1960s, you know, kind of things have flipped um, in the sense that there's always been this additional thread about Britain's relationship with the United States which happens on a kind of multi-level, including the economic. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's an excellent point and, and uh, something that I, I, I would have happily got, gotten into in the lectures. So I'm glad we're able to, to address it here. Um, yeah, so of course the, the US is uh, a, a crucial partner economically but also militarily, politically and so on of, uh, of the UK throughout this time. Um, and I think the US matters especially for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, Britain wants to maintain its uh, its economic relations with uh, with the U.S., though that doesn't that isn't particularly affected by its relations with the European Community. I think Britain uh, sees the the community not as um, sort of a, a kind of uh, closed uh, autarkic uh, grouping to join, but uh, they they want to ensure that they can continue uh, trading with uh, with the United States. Um, and also, it's important to note that the the United States in this period is partially responsible for the declining. Um, trade relations between Britain and the Commonwealth, because the US in the post-war period is eating into traditionally British uh, zones throughout the, the Commonwealth. Um, so it, it, it isn't simply a matter of dynamic European economies and a, a declining Commonwealth. The US has, has a, certainly has a hand uh, in the latter tendency. Um, and of course, as I mentioned in the lecture, I think the US was quite supportive of Britain joining the European community because they expected that it would contribute to prosperity across the, the North Atlantic, uh, which is very much in, in the US interests. Um, so they, they certainly did uh, play, play a role, and it, it is a little bit more uh, complicated than in my, my uh, simplified version of the lecture. And another question from someone at home. Okay, Margaret in London is asking, would it have been consistent with the Attlee government's policy uh, to nationalise coal and steel 
to then have ceded that area of policy to a supranational authority? Um, that's an excellent question. I, I think that was one that was debated within the Adley government uh, itself. Um, and the, the Adley government um, came to the conclusion that, um, that no, having finally brought um, control of these uh, strategic in industries into public hands, that it, it couldn't really surrender it uh, to, uh, to a supranational body. A key part of that objection, which I didn't get into in the lecture, uh, had to do with the issue of democratic accountability and representation. Um, so for the Attlee uh, government during these discussions, there was this idea that the high authority, was, it was uh, un, unelected, undemocratic. It was, at the time, it had nine um, officials. Uh, it would later turn into the, uh, the European Commission. Um, and so the, these were simply people who were appointed, yet were given uh, very significant powers uh, over British and uh, other countries' uh, strategic industries. So for the Attlee government, it was much more a question of democratic accountability and really having, uh, sort of effectively, the, the people having control over the industry rather than uh, a distant, unelected uh, representative. Any more questions in the audience? Yep, gentlemen over here. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking we're a four nation university um, and we've talked about Britain's uh, response. Is there any sort of sense of what the different, were there different views in different parts of the different nations in, in those the periods that you've discussed? So that's an excellent question. Um, and I, I should probably apologize at this point, I, I keep referring to Britain, where of course I, I'm referring to the UK, um, to, to all four, uh, four nations. Um, so I think we, we see this especially in um, the nationalist movements that emerge. Um, so the Plaid Cymru, the, the uh, Scottish nationalists, tend to oppose um, British uh, membership in the European community. In the 1975 referendum, they campaign against it um, on the grounds that they're, they're trying to win greater, uh, effectively greater sovereignty. And so surrendering uh, or transferring sovereignty from the UK to, uh, to somebody else isn't, isn't really in their interests, uh, which contrasts, of course, with uh, so the SNP's policy, notably, um, today. Um, but I think... Yeah, I, I, I don't think, say, within cabinet level or, or at the grassroots level that there were any uh, very significant differences, uh, at least to, to the point that, that it informed cabinet decisions at, at this time, uh, which may simply suggest that uh, these, these were taken less, uh, uh, le less importantly at, uh, at the time. And we have another question at home, I think. Yeah, thanks, Vincent. So this is from Harriet. She's asking if Luke could expand a little bit on the socialist position regarding the EEC, given that you said that the left wing of the day weren't very keen on closer integration. And she says she's curious to know uh, if looking at that period can shed any light on why anti-EU sentiment these days has become more of a right wing position than a left wing one. That's a very good question. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't have a ready answer to it. I, I suppose uh, one, one important factor during the, the period that we're looking at in the 1950s and 60s onwards um, is that this initial objection, this fear that uh, belonging to the European community meant that democratic socialism couldn't uh, be pursued at the national level. And this was one of the great fears of the, uh, the Attlee government in particular. Um, I think throughout the 1950s and 60s, we do see socialist governments in other members of the community uh, who are able to, to pursue this with, uh, I mean, the steel and or coal industries, which had similarly been nationalized in the early post-war period. Um, and so we, we don't see this level of interference. It's not as if the, uh, the high authority is intervening uh, and saying, no, that policy is too left-wing, you can't follow it. Um, and I think that puts, um, puts a lot of those anxieties, um, uh, or, or puts those, with those anxieties, at ease uh, within, within the Labour Party in the UK. Um, and as for why it's, le uh, it's more associated with the right than the left, um, that's an excellent question.
question. I, I think that the question may be more about why it has come to be, uh, why is it that so much of the British right has come to, to latch onto this idea of, say, national sovereignty and uh, Euroscepticism, whereas on the left that that existed, but those uh, that it's largely subsided uh, since then. I think it's it's very much a minority position uh, within the Labour Party, at least, um, that. Uh, yeah, the, the, the EU is uh, is a negative force for, for Britain. Pardon? Compliance with the leader. Yes. <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions in the audience here? Yes, we just um, gentlemen over there, then Chris afterwards. Uh, my question is in two halves. And I say from a, a leave point of view and from a remain point of view, what would you say is the main lesson from history for both sides? One pro leave and one pro remain. That, it's a fun mental exercise. Um, so I, I, I mean, the, the remain lesson, I think, is very clearly that um, I suppose throughout this period, uh, as I said, the British policy, uh, and I think it was a, a rational policy to pursue at the time was um, preserving um, access to Britain's main trading partners. And I think today it's like 53% of imports and 44% of exports are with the EU. Um, so erecting new uh, barriers and tariffs um, are singularly not in the national interest. Um, and I suppose I could build on that for a if a, to, to take more of a pro-leave um, position on this, I suppose pointing to the fact that in the early 1950s, uh, Britain did about half of its trade with the Commonwealth, um, so comparable to the amount currently done uh, with the EU today, um, yet it was able to effectively, um, well, wasn't purely uh, a decision of the British, but those, those trade flows did change over time, and they were able to find prosperity with other trading partners, uh, which had a much lower initial share of British um, trade initially. Um, although I, I personally remain unconvinced by that, uh, by that lesson. And a question from Chris as well. Um, extra factors. To what extent does the sort of British uh, experience of Suez and Macmillan's perhaps to, at the time shocking embrace of African independence movements in the wind of change speech. How much of that was part of an overall package of the Foreign Office deciding post Suez with wind of change that then a reorientation of Britain's sorry, or the UK's place in the world was necessary? Um, so I, uh, an excellent point and, and you're absolutely right to situate it in that uh, context that um, f when Britain uh, succeeds uh, Eden at the beginning of 1957, uh, there is a broad reevaluation of Britain's um, uh, foreign policy, its uh, overseas engagements, its empire, and so on. Um, and from this comes, uh, a couple of years later, um, a, a thorough assessment of effectively should Britain join uh, the European community uh, once it's set up in, in January 1958. Uh, and that, uh, the results of that report come back uh, in 1960 and makes very clear that uh, it's, it's uh, in Britain's interests to join the community rather than out, uh, than, than remain out. Um, and that uh, if Britain were to remain outside, then its decline, as seen in various examples, uh, would, would accelerate and, and continue. Do we have any more questions in the audience here? We've got a few more minutes left. Yes, Neil. Yeah, uh, can I just sort of pick you up on um, some of the sort of comments that you've made in, in other answers relating to the um, issue of sovereignty vis-a-vis um, -vis the UK population? I mean, wh why do you think it is that, I mean, I guess you can sort of see that the sovereignty argument and, and the sort of limited nature of democracy within the EU structures is a... Um, plausible argument, even if you don't find it completely persuasive, and clearly it has persuaded quite a lot of people in this country. I mean, why do you think, though, that that has been so much more persuasive 
to the UK population than it has to the, the 27 other populations of the EU? That's a very good question. I, uh, I'm, I mean, one of my instincts is that um, I mean, Britain is the only member state to have had a, uh, an, an exit referendum, right? I mean, despite talks of a potential Frexit and Grexit and so on. Um, and I think at different points in, uh, in time, actually leaving uh, seems to be a, a more popular option within individual member states. Uh, and I think in the case of the Brexit referendum, um, I mean, it, a number of factors, notably the, the time it was held, how the two campaigns were run, of course, were decisive. Um, but I think it was a number of uh, factors which contributed to this uh, outcome. I, I would suspect that, I mean, notwithstanding Britain's uh, distinctive history as, as a member of the European community and the European Union, um, I think if all the, the other 27 member states were to launch exit referendums, um, I, I'm not entirely convinced that all 27 would necessarily uh, result in, in votes to remain. Any more questions from our audience over here? Yes. <laughs> it's more of a comment, really. Uh, it was interesting when the Scots tried to break away, they, the headline was, better together. The same people are now saying, better apart. I don't understand that. But what, another thing I don't understand, a lady behind me, I don't know who it was, was talking about handing over this, that and the other from our country to them. People don't seem to realise that we are them. We are part of the European Union at the moment. Hopefully we never leave. But um, it's always to them. It's never explained that we are them. So it's yeah, I, I, <coughs> and I, I think um, I, I think there are a number of sort of long-term understandings of uh, of what Europe is uh, that have been that, that have evolved uh, over the years in Britain, um, such as uh, as that that Britain that Europe is over there and we're over here and we send money over there and so on. Um, that in some cases were encouraged and indulged by uh, politicians for uh, various reasons over the years, uh, and that that all contributed to, to the referendum um, result in 2016. Okay, I think we've got time for one quick question from Annika before we wrap up. Thanks. Well, it's <laughs> possibly also just a comment, but I'm just struck by um, the importance of the Second World War in all of this and how differently it impacted on on this country and on continental countries. And I think we talked earlier about f uh, learning lessons from history, or in this case, I think forgetting lessons from history. And it just seems so much easier in this country to forget about the Second World War, whereas that is pretty much still impossible to do in France or in Germany. So I think it is how, how Britain relates to its continental neighbours and how it relates to, to, to the history of the 20th century that's important here. And it is just fundamentally very different. Absolutely. And just a, a comment on that comment, really. <laughs> um, but it uh, certainly when I was preparing for this lecture, I, I didn't um, explain, but the, the quotation, of course, with Europe, but not of it, it comes from Churchill. Um, and I was doing a search uh, around that. Uh, and there seems to be a whole cottage industry of people arguing and, and placing op-eds in, in various newspapers in the UK, arguing what would Churchill have thought <laughs> about Brexit. Um, and, I mean, there are, you can read these by the meter, um, and various arguments about how uh, Churchill, of course, would have backed Remain, he would have backed No Deal Brexit and everything in between. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, I mean, obviously that's a, an oversimplification of the, the role of the Second uh, World War. But in terms of learning the lessons from history, uh, I think you can uh, look at the same historical figure and draw radically uh, different and mutually exclusive lessons from it. Okay, I think we're going to have to leave it there. I know Richard has an announcement now about our next uh, lecture in the series, so I'll hand over to Richard again to finish for today.
Thank you, Vincent. Yeah, I think we've grilled Luke enough. Uh, Luke, I've booked you an appointment tomorrow morning with the OU Counselling Service. <laughs> okay, make sure you're there punctually. Um, yes, thank you all for coming again. Our next lecture is on the 6th of February, I believe. It is Making This Realm of England an Empire, the Tudors in Europe. And my colleague down there, Neil Younger, will be delivering it. Can I ask you to show your appreciation for Luke one last time? He's done a great job. Cheers. Cheers.